Hey, good morning and welcome to Church at Home, our online service. We want to say a huge welcome to all of you. And if you are new and joining us for the first time, then after the service, why don't you head over to our website, www.bravechurch.co.uk. There you will be able to fill out a connection form and that will help us to be able to connect with you better. Hey guys, today we have two in-person services here in the building. How good is that? God is good. And also, we think you are good. You know, I just want to share a scripture with you. Carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfil the law of Christ. We have really seen that scripture in action this week as many of you have been giving in your donations towards the cost of the funeral of James Dean. We are amazed by your generosity and we have been able to just uh, ring up the, the funeral directors and pay a substantial amount of money off that. So we want to say thank you. Thank you for carrying somebody else's burden. And you know, even if you have missed out on that and you still want to give, there are always opportunities to give. As long as you put a reference in of James, we will make sure that that money goes directly to the funeral directors. And also this week, there are other opportunities to give. This week, it is half term week. So that means one thing, we can help so many families with their food parcels this week. Sarah and Jonathan Hans will be out delivering. So if you want to give to that, then please give. Right guys, we're going to go and enjoy the rest of the service together. This week we're learning all about the new heaven and the new earth. So make sure you pay attention to the next video. John was a disciple of Jesus. One day, Jesus came to him in a vision, shining like the sun. Don't be afraid, said Jesus. I died. Now I live forever. Then. John saw a new heaven and a new earth, God's promised new creation. The first heaven and the first earth were gone and the sea with them. Next, John saw God's holy city, the new Jerusalem. It was coming down from heaven. It was beautiful like a bride on her wedding day, ready to meet her husband. <gasps> then, John heard a loud voice coming from the throne of God, saying, From now on, God will make his home among his people, and they will all live together. In this new heaven and new earth, there won't be any tears because no one will be in pain and no one will die. Those things are gone forever. <gasps> then the voice from the throne said, I am the beginning and the end. If you are thirsty, come to me and I will give you the water of life. My new world is for my children, those who are faithful to me. I'm making all things new. It's true. You can count on it. <gasps> now 
find some questions, so I hope you're paying attention to that video. Good. At least are you ready? <laughs> I don't know what that was. That was a bit weird. <laughs> that wasn't really weird. That was weird. <laughs> I don't know what, what do, I, I say the same thing every time. <laughs> what, you just went, good. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for some questions, so I hope you were paying attention to that video. I hope you were as well, Elise. I was. Right, question number one. What did John see in his vision? Well, Jesus showed John the new heaven and the new earth, and I think he also showed him God's holy city. Yeah, that's right, well done. Question number two, what will be gone forever in the new heaven and new earth? I think there'll be no tears, yeah. no pain and no death. Yeah, that's right, well done. Question number three, who did Jesus say his new kingdom was for? I think he said it was for his children, but also all those who are faithful to Jesus. Yeah, well done. Well done if you guys got those right as well. Jesus shared with John a wonderful promise of a new kingdom that we get to spend eternity with Jesus in. None of the pain and sorrow and death of this earth will be there. At the end of God's big story, there's the start of the new beginning. This includes the new heaven and the new earth, and all those who trust in Jesus can have it too. So now we're going to do our memory verse. I'm going to do the actions first and Grace is going to do them after me. Are you ready? Yes. To all who are thirsty. To all who are thirsty. I will give freely. I will give freely. From the springs of the water of life. From the springs of the water of life. Revelation 21 verse 6. Revelation 21 verse 6. Are you ready? Yeah. Oh, I'm on. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> yes. I don't know what you're ready for, Grace, but you're ready. <laughs> Are you ready to do it together? Yeah. Let's do it. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. <laughs> Amen. Okay, from okay. the top. Are you ready to try it together? Yeah. Let's do it. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. Revelation 21 verse 6. This is the end of Brave Kids Church, so Grace is just going to pray for us, so why don't you gather as a family, bow your heads and close your eyes. Dear God, thank you so much for your promise. Help me to remember that whenever I'm struggling, I can look forward to spending eternity with you in the new heaven and new earth. Amen. Amen. This week we want to encourage you to reach out to someone who's feeling sad or maybe lonely and tell them about the new heaven and the new earth. I hope you have a great week, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye. your body, the wine, your blood, sweet communion, you set a table for us, the crucified Jesus, no greater love than the bread, your body, than the wine, your blood. i
A number of years ago, before we had children, Nigel and I went on holiday to Spain and um, one afternoon we decided we were going to go for a walk. So we headed off and decided we'd come back via the coast. So as we set off, we saw these rocks sticking out and kind of boulder shaped and looked like they'd be quite good to climb along. So we thought we'd take that route going back and we set off on these rocks. And as we began to get a little bit higher, we reached one rock where we had to jump across to get to it. So we both jumped across, landed on this rock and we're both there. It's about 20 foot above the sea. The waves are crashing below us. And um, this rock's on a, a slight incline. So not nothing major, but you know, a little bit of a slope going on there. Nigel's in front of me. I'm behind him on this rock and I started to slip. So I call out, Nigel, I'm slipping. So he reaches back behind him and he, he holds out his hand and he gets hold of me. So there we are, both of us on this rock. I'm slipping because he's holding my hand. He's now beginning to slip as well. I mean, it must have been there about two or three minutes, but let me tell you, it felt a lot longer. And Nigel just came to the conclusion, do you know what? I can't do anything in this position. So something's going to have to change. So he decided he was going to let go of my hand. He was going to scramble to the top of the rock, turn around and reach back down and help me up. So he did. He let go of my hand. He let his wife go. He was slipping on this rock. Can you believe that? The shock and the horror and the shame of it. Anyway, off he went. He scrambled up to the top, turned around, looked back down to reach for me, and I wasn't there. I wasn't where he left me because for some, somehow, in some miracle, I had also managed to climb up behind him and I was safe on the top of this rock. And we both survived and we're both still married. That's happy, happy news, happy days. But do you know what? The only way we could get out of the situation was for Nigel to let go. He had to have the courage to make a decision and to make a move. And I heard a quote this week and it says this, during these uncertain times, we're looking for those who have the courage to take a leap into the unknown. And as we're in this season of dangerous prayers, you know, I wonder, are we those kind of people that are prepared to take a leap into the unknown when it comes to our faith? Has anybody got the book yet, by the way? It's an amazing book. Type it in the chat if you've got it, Dangerous Prayers. And more importantly, have you actually had the courage to open it and start reading it? It is a really good book and I highly recommend it. And we're going to look at a prayer today prayed by a young boy called Samuel. Samuel was a gift from God. His parents had prayed for him and God had blessed them with him. And they chose to dedicate his life back to God. So from the age of about three or four, he was living in the temple. He was serving under the priest Eli, who'd given the word that he was going to be born. Eli had two sons of his own and these boys had grown up around the things of God and yet they had no respect for God or for the things of God. In fact, the Amplified Bible describes these boys as worthless, dishonourable, unprincipled men who didn't know or respect the Lord. And it's possible to grow up around the things of God, to be in church life and yet to not know God for yourself. And Eli knew that his sons weren't living as they should and he did speak to them, but they didn't listen. And he just kind of left it. He didn't really reinforce that. He didn't remove them from the position in the temple. It was almost like he turned a blind eye or he kind of had this hope that something would change naturally, but it didn't. And then there's Samuel, this gift from God, a real blessing to be around who's thriving and flourishing in the house of God. And we're going to pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. My son Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. Then Eli realised that the Lord was speaking, calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling us at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. 
And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sins he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, here I am. What was it he said to you, Eli said? Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. Samuel's believed to have been about 11 or 12 when this story was written, and he would have slept near to Eli in case Eli needed anything. Eli was an old man. He couldn't see well, and you know, he wasn't physically very able to move around. So Samuel was there to help. And they settle down for the night. And in verse four, the Lord calls Samuel's name and he answers, here am I. He jumps up and goes to Eli. Samuel's willing and ready and available to do whatever is needed. And it happens three times. And it's not until the third time that Eli realizes what's going on. He's an old man now. He understands what the voice of God sounds like. But the sad thing is, he doesn't hear it for himself anymore. Samuel's a young boy and it says in verse 7, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him, but he's ready. At the call of his name, he's there. And Eli encourages him, doesn't he? He encourages him to go and lie back down. And when he hears a voice to say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. That's a bold, dangerous prayer to pray. It's one thing to ask God to speak. It's another thing to choose to listen, but then to actually do what God is saying is a whole nother level as well. And we're going to look at this young boy's life and see what we can learn from it and see if we too can find the courage to pray, speak Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel's willing, he's got a heart for God and the first thing we see in him is a willingness to be in the right place. There's six of us who live in our house and trying to get everyone in the right place can be quite tricky whether that's for a meal or watching a film or getting ready to go out, we all end up getting distracted. And I thought actually it might get a bit easier as the boys get older, but apparently not. So many times somebody who could be ready and could be in the right place isn't. Maybe they've got distracted doing something else or maybe they're distracting somebody else who ought to be ready. And often you'll hear this phrase, if you were in the right place at the right time doing the right thing, you wouldn't now be in trouble. If we're going to pray that prayer, speak Lord, your servant is listening, then we have to be ready to listen and we have to be intentionally positioning ourselves to do that. That means being in the right place. But we're in this culture where, like my family, we get very easily distracted on the way to doing something else. Our culture is one of busyness, isn't it? From the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep, there's always something to do. There's activities, there's phone calls, there's jobs to be done. You know, there's, there's always kind of extra activities going on if you've got kids. There's all sorts of things that choose to fill our time. And then there's the added bonus of social media. You know, you nip on to, to look for something and 10 minutes, half an hour, an hour later, you're still scrolling through. And then there's all the series that you want to watch on Netflix or some other, you know, kind of device that you can watch stuff on. And, you know, we want to watch all these recommendations that people have given us. And it just feels like there's no time to do anything. But actually there is. Maybe it's just about how we're using our time. Samuel went and lay down in his place. That's what it says in verse nine. This was between him and God. It wasn't between Eli or anybody else. This was something that Samuel had to do on his own. And often I think we struggle to hear God ourselves because either somebody's in our space or we're in somebody else's space. You know, as a church, we're halfway through the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality course. And one of the great things that we're encouraged to do every week is to create space within the day to spend time with God, to be intentional about doing that, to be intentional about slowing down your pace so you're creating that time with God. Jesus was very intentional about spending time with his Father. It says in Mark 1.35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. 
in Matthew 14, 22 and 23, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Jesus says in Matthew as well, when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what he's done in secret will reward you. Samuel had his place. Where's yours, I wonder? You know, in a house full of people, it can be really tough to find a place, but it's there if you look for it. Susanna Wesley, who lived in the late 1600s and early 1700s, had 19 children, 10 of whom lived. Two of them were Charles and John Wesley, who I'm sure you've heard of. They were famous preachers and they also wrote many amazing hymns. Susanna was married to a preacher, so she had all the responsibilities that came with church life. She homeschooled all her children. She also ran the farm where they lived. Life wasn't easy for her. In fact, it was very, very busy and there was a lot of challenges that she faced. But she made a decision that she would give two hours every day to God, to praying and reading her Bible. There was no quiet space. There was no prayer room. There was no luxury of going into a room and closing a door and having some quiet time. But she found a way. She would sit down and she would put her apron over her head and she would almost create like a little tent. And within that, that was her space. That was her place to be with God. And all of her children from the very smallest up knew that when her apron was over her head, she was not to be disturbed unless it was an absolute emergency. There's always a way to find a place and get your space with God. We just have to be really intentional about finding it. And it's in that stillness and in that place where God speaks. Psalm 46 verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. Be still, not be multitasking and know that I am God. Be still. You can guarantee the moment you intend to go and spend time with God, suddenly your mind becomes filled with all the things you need to do. Why not take a pen and paper with you, write them down and pick it up again after when you've finished spending time with God. Your phone will be quiet all day until you choose to go and spend time with God. So why not either put it on silent or leave it outside the place where you are and pick it up again after. Your kids will be absolutely fine until you choose to go and spend time with God and they'll be knocking on your door. Even if dad's in the house as well, they'll come and find you out. I know that from personal experience. But do you know what? You've got to be ruthless and you've got to fight for that time. You fight for your place so you can get that time with God. Samuel got his place and the second, the second thing we see is that he had a willingness to listen. A few weeks ago, we had a parents' evening for one of my boys and I'm not going to mention any names, but those of you who know us as a family will know who I'm talking about. So the parents' evening is uh, online and you get four minutes per subject teacher. So it's quite a brief conversation, but it tells you what you need to know. And uh, generally, actually, it was a really good parents' evening. We got some good feedback. He's doing well in his subjects. But there was one recurring theme that came from pretty much all of the teachers. And that was that he's a really good contributor. He loves to share his ideas. He's always got something to say, which is brilliant. You know, you, it's really good, isn't it, when you're able to contribute. But he's not very good at listening to others and letting other people have their say and have their opinion. And so, you know, we've, we've been reminding him that maybe he needs to talk less and listen more. And we'll see next year's parents' evening will tell us whether that's actually happened or not. But I wonder, what are you like? Are you more of a talker or a listener? I wonder if we ask somebody who knows you well, whether they would agree with your assessment of yourself. You know, I've been in conversations where I know I've talked way too much. And then I've been in conversations where I've not had the opportunity to talk at all. Um, but, you know, Samuel, he's never heard God's voice before. He has no idea what it sounds like. And he prays, speak, your servant is listening. But before you say something, God, can I just tell you, you know, this is who I am. This is my background. This is where I'm from. This is what's going on in my life. No, no, he didn't really. He didn't say any of that. He prays, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And then he does just that. He listens. How often do we come to our quiet times with God, full of things to say? And you know, it's right that we have time to pour out our hearts to God, to pray on behalf of others, to bring our requests. That's right. But I wonder when was the last time you intentionally chose to spend time with God just to listen, not to say anything at all? How often can we miss key bits in our conversations 
because we're too bothered about what we're going to say next rather than listening to what's actually being said to us. You know, God speaks to us all the time, but I think we miss a lot because we're not intentionally listening. You know, God speaks to us through the Bible. He speaks to us through conversations, through circumstances, through his Holy Spirit prompting and guiding us. I wonder though, have you ever taken time to intentionally listen to who he says you are? You live as if you're unworthy and undeserving of his love, but you're not. You are so very loved. You are chosen. You are his child. You are accepted. You are forgiven. But if you never take time to stop and listen to who he says you are, you will never become who you really truly could be. I want to encourage you, be intentional about creating time and spending time just to listen with God and see what he's got to say to you. The final thing we learn from Samuel is about having a willingness to do. Speak your servant is listening is a dangerous prayer to pray because once God's spoken, we then have to do something about it. Yes, God's with us, but he won't ever force us to change an attitude or to speak to someone. He'll speak and he'll leave the response to you. And that's where we almost cross over into another dangerous prayer, your will be done, which hopefully we'll look at in the coming weeks. You know, God might speak to you a few times about the same thing, but it's still your choice. He won't ever force you to do something. And if you choose not to make the move when he's spoken to you, what you might find is that you're in a situation or in a place a little bit longer than maybe you'd hoped to be. Samuel was given this message from God and it's not easy to deliver. And it says in verse 15, he was afraid to tell Eli the vision. We can have our fears of other people's reactions, of upsetting or offending someone, of saying the wrong thing. That can stop us from doing what God has said. But I think fear of God and a right healthy fear of God is what allowed Samuel to tell Eli the message, even though it was tough and even though it was hard. It was obedience and God honours that obedience and Samuel learned that at a really young age. And it says in verse 19, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. He let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. As we choose to listen, we need to have a willingness and an obedience on the inside to be ready to do what God asks us. I'll cut off that relationship because it's not doing me any good. I'll forgive that offence. I'll speak the truth about that situation. I'll guard my mouth so I'm not constantly speaking negatively. I'll make contact with that person who I chose to avoid all those years ago. I'll deal with that wrong attitude. I'll stop trying to be right all the time. I'll put down my excuses and pick up my Bible. I'll stop trying to work everything out and trust my life to God. As we choose to listen to the still small voice of God and do what he's asking us to do, God will prompt you and encourage you and stir you to do more. So maybe you'll begin to pray about situations rather than worrying about them. Maybe you'll start to fill your life with worship rather than looking to substances to help you. Maybe you'll share a verse with someone or pray for someone or invite someone to church or share your story of what God's done in your life. Maybe the biggest challenge though is to be someone who listens. So many people feel like they're not being heard, like they don't have a voice. There's an epidemic of loneliness. When we talk to people so often, all we're trying to do is think about our response or share our story and, and empathise because we've been there and we can tell you about what's gone on in our world. But maybe we need to learn to just listen. Jesus met a woman at a well and they start having a conversation and she talks about the fact that she has no husband and Jesus already knows this. He knew she'd been married five times. He knew that the man she was living with wasn't her husband. But do you know what? He doesn't judge her. He doesn't condemn her doesn't bring any guilt or shame to her. He doesn't say, oh, you've had it tough, but let me tell you about my life. I was born to a mum who wasn't married and then the man she married wasn't my dad and I've got stepbrothers and sisters and it's tough and it's challenging. He didn't do any of that. It wasn't about him. It wasn't about his upbringing and Jesus was really secure. He had no identity issues, but this conversation wasn't about him. It wasn't about over-empathising. It was about listening listening to God and listening to this woman. You know, as he did that, he knew that the foundation of the conversation was what God thought about this woman because he'd listened and he'd heard. How quick can we be to presume and assume we know where someone's coming from or to think we understand why they're behaving the way they're behaving 
we miss so much and we can treat people so wrongly because we fail to stop and listen. And I know I've done it so many times. I've made my own assumptions, my own judgments. I've come to my own conclusions based on my very limited knowledge rather than on a truth that I've heard from God because I've intentionally chosen to listen to him. People need a saviour. It's Jesus we need. We don't need condemning or judging or shaming into changing. Knowing Jesus is the key and the radical transformation that he brings to our lives through the power of his blood is what we need. We need his unconditional love. We need his unending grace and mercy. It's his truth that will set us free. That's what we need. It's not always, if ever, easy to do what God asks us to do, whether that's an internal attitude that needs changing or whether it's a prophetic message to a nation like Samuel had to deliver. But the one thing you can be confident of is that God is with you and he'll equip you to do whatever it is he's asking you to do. Can I encourage you not to pray the prayer, speak, for your servant is listening, if you don't want to hear what God is going to say and you don't want to do it. But let me encourage you to pray it, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. If you're ready to hear his voice speaking to you, if you're prepared to walk in obedience, and if you're ready to embark on an adventure of walking by faith and not by sight, and to reap the blessings that come with that. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we just thank you for your incredible words, and we thank you for the amazing prayers that we read that others have prayed before us. Thank you for Samuel. Thank you for that prayer he prayed, speak, your servant is listening. And God, I pray that we too would have the courage to pray that. That God, we would create the time and the place where we need to listen. That God, we'd be willing to listen to what it is you're asking us to do. And then God, we would be willing and ready to do what it is that you said to us. Lord, help us to be a people of courage, a people who walk by faith and not by sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Such an amazing message by Sus this morning, all about the willingness that we can show to God. And, you know, today, maybe the, for the first time you're hearing about Jesus and maybe today your willingness is to say a prayer, to ask him into your life. You know, if you want to do that for the very first time, then why don't you pray along with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I need a saviour. I confess today that you are the Son of God and Lord of all. I ask that you would forgive me of my wrongdoing. I know you died on the cross for my sin and you rose again so that we could have victory and freedom. I now give you my life. Help me to follow you and experience you in my days. I trust in you. Amen. If you have said that prayer, or maybe if you have heard something in the message today and you would like to speak to somebody further about it, then why don't you email us at hello at bravechurch.co.uk and somebody will be in touch with you. For the rest of us, then don't forget that you can follow us on social media and you can head over to our YouTube channel where there you will find all our sermons. You know, have a great week, guys, and just be blessed to be a blessing.